It's the Waiting for Next Year.com podcast. You probably know Jake Burns by now. Um, it's been about six months, right, Jake? Yeah, right. Yeah, right around there. It's kicked off right before Brown season. You guys luckily took me in. It's been uh, it's been right around six months. Pretty pretty dang good six months for me. Yeah, for us too, man. You're like the the video clip the video clip king. Yeah, no, it's a it's a niche that I found that not many in the Browns media or kind of the market in general do just as an avenue for people to understand the game a little bit more not that i obviously think i know everything but i do think it's good to give the clip with some feedback for people to to come to their own conclusions and and guide a bit and i think it's helped i feel like it's helped the fan base understand some things this year well it's certainly a good way to back up your points it's uh rather than just say hey you remember when they did this thing on that play you just show it to them and they they can you know the way uh gifs and video clips load nowadays they repeat so everybody gets to watch the same block or the same route that a receiver runs over and over and over again and it's uh it's it's kind of changed the way we take in film on the internet yeah yeah absolutely i would agree it's it's really really sound stuff for big plays like you said really sound stuff for helping people formulate opinions on draft prospects not that the common person's opinion matters all too much but um, no, it's it's a game changer for people to understand NFL content, and um, I think it'll keep taking off as the years go by and more and more media members get comfortable with it. So who are you? Where did you come from? How did you cut your teeth in football? I mean, what, what brings you to like doing this as a hobby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up playing football. I played three sports in a small school in Marion, Ohio, and wanted to keep playing football in college, so I went to Muskingum, a uh, small D3 liberal arts school the in the OAC. The Muskies, indeed. Um, it's an OAC school over in southeast Ohio, so I went there, played uh, played quarterback for, for three years. My sophomore through senior year, I started there. Had a pretty good career, all things considered. We were pretty average. Mount Union, John Carroll, pretty tough conference, so we held our own as best we could. Um, really liked it. I majored in English and wanted to teach and coach and went that route for a little bit and then coached in, at the OCC, which is Central Ohio schools, um, Pickerington Central, Pickerington North, Gahanna, some really good football this way. Developed an offense, ran my own offense like that a lot. Um, kind of life changes course for me. Didn't want to do that anymore necessarily. There's a lot of reasons for that. That's an entire other podcast, but uh, Switched up, and then as I was doing, I went into insurance marketing, um, doing a little bit of online endeavors for insurance agents that I still had the itch for football. So I always thought that I had missed my calling a little bit as a journalist, trying to be a journalist at least with with the angle of understanding the game. So I uh, I found what I thought was the was the the best independent blog in Cleveland. Tried to jump in. You guys luckily took me in and found a niche on the internet. So certainly through Twitter is, is probably the best medium to use, but that's how I've, I've dove into studying NFL content, passing it along, draft prospects, some of those things. So it's a little bit of luck mixed in with a little bit of knowledge. So now you're, you're knee deep in Brown's Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. It's an experience. It's, it's a, it's a place packed with vitriol. I mean, it's just uh it's, it's a fan base that just needs to win so they can ease up on each other. It, it's, yeah, I don't really have the right words for it currently. It's a uh, a group that's passionate as hell. They really want to win, um, but it, it's it's an attacking nature right now that is unfortunate. And I hope, that, like I said, that the winning in some time in the future can bring everybody together to uh, enjoy it a little bit more. The last time the Browns had a good season, Twitter didn't even exist. Yeah, that's a sad stat. That's a sad fact. Yeah, but and I'm is, not. And I'm not. Real. I'm not here for all those stats about how many. Star Wars movies have come out since the Browns last won or won a road game or like it's fine like I, I don't think it's bad to point that stuff out but it doesn't compel me either but it really I mean the fact that there are stats like that you don't have to try that hard to come up with really crazy stats that and that's just how bad the Browns have been and that's that's what we're here to talk about tonight the, the Browns go O for the season um you know, I, I wouldn't say that you and you and I are at odds with each other when it comes to Brown's criticism, but I think one of the one of the negatives of some place like Twitter or even writing back and forth in our Slack channel is that it's hard to find that common ground um, as easily as when you're just talking it out. Uh, and and I think we probably agree on a whole lot more than we disagree with. Although, um, I I don't know. I, I guess I'll start there. Um, 
so now that the Browns sit here at 0 and 16 and they've reaffirmed their support as it were for for Hugh Jackson um and John Dorsey's coming in like what 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 are your thoughts today um and I mean how, are you miserable are you kind of floating along with it where are you Yeah I, I think um like you said a lot of a lot of the current state of our conversation boils down to two people Sashi Brown and and Hugh Jackson, I think that, like you said, we're going to have a lot of things that we agree on. My, my current state of the Browns with with Hugh Jackson, because that's really the only angle. I mean, we've all talked about John Dorsey, and I, I don't think John Dorsey hiring was poor, bad, or in between. I, th- I think it was a good hire. I think John Dorsey has a track record for finding talent in the NFL. I have, I have zero issue with John Dorsey's hire. I like him. Um, I don't totally believe um, in Hugh Jackson. I'm not too naive to think that if Hugh Jackson had a more talented roster, a deeper roster, he could we he could be a winning NFL coach. Um, there are some elements that I watch that really really frustrate me, um, and and lead me to believe that one in thirty one is just it's as bad as it could have gone for him. Um, in in terms of you're you're ultimately judged as a head coach by winning and losing, and I know that the roster. And possibly the vision of the Browns in the past two years hasn't been, hey, look at our win loss record and tell us what we're doing. But it, it really is through a through a, through a microscope going to be judged on win loss. And I think that the roster Hugh has had, especially this year as compared to last year, has been good enough to win some games. Now, is there a big difference between four and twelve and zero and sixteen? Not really. But in year two, people needed to see improvement tangible improvement that could be felt on the surface level and unfortunately for today's you know consumer of football that that tangible level is did we win or did we lose so i think that he has failed and we'll get into the intricacies of where he has failed in my opinion but i am not too naive to think that he was dealing with a roster that could have been a wild card team even um you know, or went eight and eight. I don't think that that talent level is here, but I do look at some teams like the Jets um, specifically who have a pretty similar base of skill that one, I think that could have been something the Browns, I even should have been something the Browns accomplished. So, um, you know, do I love that they're keeping Hugh? No, I don't. I think that they could have gone a different direction. You're talking about kind of some crazy stats. They haven't given a coach a third year since, uh, Romeo Cornell, and and this is the one Jimmy decides to give a third year to. So I, you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily think this is the right choice, but I can also understand trying to seek some continuity. I see, I see both sides. So I try to I try to keep a balance to all of this in a, in a in a microscope or in a vacuum. I'm sorry. I think that Hugh Jackson has failed here. Has it been all Hugh Jackson? Absolutely not. You're going to dive into that. I'm sure there have been guys like Ben Axelrod who have wrote. I've tried to pin a piece on this too, that the blame is, is everywhere within the organization. So um, current state is 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 not going to, to leave you feeling overwhelmingly confident with Hugh back, but they have a lot of draft capital. They have a lot of free agency money, and they have a GM who can evaluate talent, has a track record of doing so. So I feel okay with that. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Yeah, I, and I, I agree that there's more talent on the team this year than last year, and I think that the the talent level might be comparable to the Jets. It might be comparable to a number of teams in every situation except the quarterback. And I think that based on reading the tea leaves and, and talking to people, and, I, you know, I'm not really well-sourced, but I talk to people, uh, and, and it's it's my feeling that that Hugh Jackson – you know, our concern about him is that maybe he can't win more than eight games, not that he can't win a single game. And so I, I think with his track record and his history in the league, there's only one place to look. Yeah, And this is why I, I got so frustrated with, with the Sashi Brown defenders uh, as this season was going along. It's like, not only is it not working, but like this guy, this guy, the only reason anybody ever believed in him or his plan is because he was entrusted to do the job by Jimmy Haslam, who none of us believe in at all, I don't think. And and so while I agreed with some parts of the plan, um, I just, 
it, when when Hugh Jackson starts speaking out about how he's not being listened to or he's not getting his guys or he's surprised when roster moves are being made, I was surprised that the fan base didn't turn on Sashi Brown fast. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think that there's a level of Sashi Brown apology that is a bit alarming. I think that there were elements, um, the same with when we evaluate Hugh, there were elements of Hugh that I think can translate to wins. And there are elements of what Sashi did that I think can translate to wins too. But if you look at, if you put everything in front of you in terms of what Sashi has accomplished in his time here, there is no denying that Sashi Brown failed to bring in the necessary pieces to, if the, if the goal was to win some games, win, you know, three or four or five games, this year as a as a mark of tangible improvement you can't you can't look at the quarterback situation and feel like they did them a favor they set it up to to succeed yes there are going to be the things that we talk about with the draft the 2016 draft was a failure um you know i just i think that there's there's reason to doubt that Carson Wentz could have been Carson Wentz here but you can't have that mindset you have to take that guy. Um, Carson Wentz has proven to be that guy. So have others, Jalen Ramsey, Ezekiel Elliott. That's just a miss. There's no doubt about that. And the same for, for, for last year. I think that you could obviously make a claim to have Deshaun Watson be that guy. Now, Deshaun Watson has not proven enough to me to truly believe in him the way I need to believe in him. So I, I try to let that one play out a little bit longer. But there's no denying they haven't, like you said, it is a quarterback-driven league. If you solve that position, you solve a lot. They haven't solved it. And I think that, you know, whether Hugh wanted Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes and they didn't get him for him or, or whatever the case may be, I think if you put Hugh and Sashi into a chair together, you know, right next to each other and say, do we think that this was the best situation to go into for our quarterbacks, you know, the way that they went into 2017, there's no way either of them could admit that's that's the best plan to have in place. So, Again, there are parts of what Sashi did that I did not like. There's no denying that. I don't think Sashi was necessarily the overwhelming part of the issue. I think there's somebody above him that is a bigger part of the issue. But, yes, I'm with you. There, there's, They tried something off the wall with Sashi. It is no surprise that it didn't result in tangible wins. There are parts of the plan that, that are redeemable and could be even copied to an extent. But there's... There's certainly no denying that Sashi Brown has a pretty big part in this. And, 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 and if you want to argue that his part is much bigger than Hughes, it's hard to, to go against that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I think I think that Sashi did leave Hugh behind. And, and it is interesting where people take a side on this in today's culture about you're either with Sashi or against him or you're either with Hugh or you're against him. There's a middle ground in all of this, and I try to talk to as many people as I can that you can recognize people's failures while also giving them credit to, to kind of paint that path going forward. So I don't put all of Hugh's issues on, on Hugh. I think that there are some things that have gone wrong that he has been behind the eight ball on. I also don't think that Sashi was put in the best position to succeed either, or at least given the chance to let it succeed, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I think that's, I, I agree with a lot of that. And I, I think that I end up coming off like a Hugh Jackson defender because I have a certain v- view that I think is reality where I look at Hugh Jackson and I think I agree with your criticisms. I agree with Bodie's criticisms, all the, all the different people who, that I know who are reasonable in their criticism of Hugh Jackson. I agree with them all. I think that the defense for keeping Hugh Jackson might be unique to the Cleveland Browns in 2017 going into 2018, where <clears throat> uh, I wrote about it today, the, the ghost of Rob Chudzinski I think yeah. any other situation in the National Football League, any other team, they would they would fire Hugh Jackson without thinking twice. I think Cleveland is the only scenario where they they kind of didn't have a choice because I don't know what a coach search would have yielded for them considering what they've done to previous candidates, uh, you know, Chud and Mike Pett. Yeah, no doubt. And there's 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 parts of this we don't know. Is there are there clauses in Hugh's contract? Because Hugh was a hot name when he was brought in. I mean, I remember being, you know, cautiously excited about it, but I was I thought that they had did a pretty good job getting the hire. And uh, you know, is there something in Hugh's language in his contract that says he had pretty much three years? There's there there are things behind the scenes that we don't know, and there are things that you know about. Uh, parts of what happened with Sashi Brown that I don't know. There, it's so hard from the outside to judge things when in people in the in the soft press, you know, people reading things through secondhand accounts, 
are are folks who are looking at a quote and making a judgment. Well, Hugh didn't want this guy, or Sashi didn't want that. We don't, you don't totally know. So it's it is, it is extremely difficult for us to have a great understanding of what actually happened. But it is pretty obvious to see that there are failures on both sides. And like you said, is, is if you make a move to fire Hugh Jackson right now, who who is the name that is going to want to come here? I mean, there's a little bit of name appeal because you have the first and fourth pick, and you have John Dorsey, who's a you know a pretty well established and, and and pretty solid reputation as a GM. But at the same time, you have the Browns' history, and in that history, you're going to find a lot of things that you know aren't necessarily working in a coach's favor. So as a young guy like a Matt Nagy or Pete Carmichael's not young necessarily or, or Matt LaFleur or any of these young guys, DiFilippo, who people want, are they going to say, okay, I will put my name on the line as a head coach now and I'll just jump in with the Browns. Like you only tri- typically get one shot as a head coach and, and you want to, you want to make sure you maximize that opportunity as, as coaches have a choice of turning down a job or accepting it. So you're right. There's a little bit of that, Rochadzitsky history, the Browns quick trigger on these things that played into Hugh Jackson. There's also the who's actually going to take the job to replace some kind of thing. Yeah, there are some factors that work in the Browns' favor, but there's history that works well against that favor that really proves a point, too. I mean, even Pat Shermer, who was miserable here, it's, it's what, been five or six, five seasons? This will be the sixth, uh, and he's finally being talked about as getting another shot. Eric Mangini has never really been seriously talked about getting another shot. It, it it really is kind of, you know, either either succeed to the level of John Fox at least, or you're never going to work again. Yeah, no, you're right, and that's that's the that's the challenge a coach has to consider is, you know, if it doesn't work out for me, which history shows, it doesn't work out for me in <laughs> Cleveland. <laughs> you know, do do I get a second shot? And 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 that runs through somebody's mind because they got to lay out all the all the options here. So, you know, is 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 it the right call from the Browns' perspective to say, um, you know, if we fire Hugh, maybe Hugh's not the right guy for this job. He's proven it over the last two years, X, Y, and Z. Or here are your examples, and and you know, those examples aren't very hard to find. Um, you know, like. We'll, then we'll, get, we'll probably talk about those later, but those examples aren't hard to find. Like I'm saying, does that mean that you justify keeping a guy just be, because we don't know who else we could get? You know, from sitting on my sofa, that's easy to sit here and say that's pretty asinine approach to, to hiring and firing. But <laughs> this is the real world that they operate in, and you have to consider it could actually get worse probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, we have seen dysfunction – Yes, I mean, the Browns have a certain level of dysfunction right now. There's no denying that, but there's also other levels of dysfunction that get worse. There are other organizations that can talk to you about. I mean, look at Josh McDaniel's tenure, a hot name. I mean, he goes to Denver, has a pretty poor track record in drafting, and in his second year totally tanks the organization with a, with a videotaping scandal. So there, there are levels of, of getting worse here. Now, I just think that the, the, the decision to – what it all boils down to, in my opinion, Craig, is the decision to rebuild off of what was already so poor. It can't even be called a rebuild. It was a different way to build. If the Steelers, for example, Big Ben retires this offseason and they say, OK, we need, you know, and, and Shazier's deemed that he can't play again. And, and Le'Veon Bell decides he wants to play somewhere else next year for big money. And Antonio Brown is their lone guy remaining. And they say, hey, man, we got a really clean house here to figure this out. That's a fan base that could endure that thing. Or the, the Patriots, when Tom Brady retires eventually and they don't have a quarterback predecessor and they have to figure it out. Those are the types of teams that can call it a rebuild. They're going to they're going to rock bottom out and then try to build through the draft and collect assets. That works for that fan base. But when you have a fan base like Cleveland who has endured so much struggle and then you want to bottom out as to the level of bottoming out that they wanted to bottom out to – you had to understand that it was going to get this ugly, like not 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 from a fan's perspective, but the, the the organization needed to recognize that. So when you let guys like Schwartz walk away, and you let guys like Gibson and Jordan Poyer and Taylor Gabriel, and the list goes on, Travis Benjamin, Alex Mack, when you let those guys get away, you're now left with no foundation. You're left with a, a track record of losing, and you're trying to build from scratch with the youngest guys in the league. So. It's just it's a it's a recipe for disaster, and we're seeing the disaster come to fruition. 
So, do you think anybody will ever try uh, anything that's drastic ever again? I mean, even in your example of the, the Steelers or the Patriots, if they're going to make a move like that, and we saw this happen with the Colts way back when, they, they kept a guy like Reggie Wayne around to, to bridge the, the culture but from one generation to the next, and the Patriots presumably could do that with any number of players, and same with the Steelers. Uh, the Browns, on the other hand, other than Joe Thomas, didn't really have anybody or any culture to to help you know, to bridge from point A to point B. Yeah, no, that's a good point. There's, I think I had looked up at one point. I had posted it in our Slack conversation between WF and Y guys about guys on the Browns roster two years ago compared to today, and it was eight guys were total left from the 2015 roster on this year's group at the end of the year, which is crazy. It's a staggering number. And if you consider where the Eagles and the Jags were, teams that have turned it around, even the the Jags are the best example. Yes, or the Raiders when they went last year compared to two years prior to last year, they were all in the 20s, like low 20s to even mid 20s. So then you you find yourself saying, you know, what, what, what was the goal? The goal could not have been to win. You can't expect because, for example, we look at Sashi's draft history. If Sashi, if they didn't, and I don't know whose ultimatum it was given to clean house like they clean house. Maybe it was Sashi. Maybe Sashi made that decision independently. Maybe it was a groupthink effort. I'm not sure, and I don't. I think I'll ever know, unless I've missed an article that's been out. But to sit there and think that okay, you're going to get two drafts, and you're going to have to essentially hit on every draft pick, at least a 90 percent hit rate to have these guys be impactful in their two years the the recipe was the problem because i think sashi made some good picks that if he were coming into say a seven and nine team or an eight and eight team that well, ironically he's coming a couple years off a of seven and nine team but nonetheless you, you i think you get where i'm going with this his hit rate wasn't that poor but when they put as much pressure on themselves as an organization whether through sashi's decision to wipe out the roster or not they they made the pressure real. They made the pressure that they had to hit on more draft picks than was the norm, and they didn't. And that's that's why you see, um, you know, a team with probably twenty five guys ish that are guys that can be a part of a good NFL roster. Can you win a game or two with that group? Maybe, possibly, but you're you're really risking it. And when you risk it, and things to have a, a way of Murphy's Lawing like they do in in, in First Energy Stadium. You're going to see a possibility of going 0 and 16, and that's where they're at. I just, I, I think that to 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 kind of put a, a bow on all of this, where I come from, the 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 people in place to me were not terrible per se. To me, it was the plan that I didn't ever fall in line with, and I don't know. That could have been Craig, like I said, that could have been the decision of one of one person that could have been the decision of multiple people to go with this, but you can't say, Hey, any NFL roster X, Y, or Z, we have this team right now. And in two years, we're going to have eight guys that are on it from this team. And we're going to try to be winning competitively in the NFL. It, It is, it is just, it's impossible. So I think that, there are parts of this that, that you can look at, such as Sashi and such as Hugh, that have failed in aspects, and there's no denying it. But the plan itself, coming off what they were coming off of with 3-13, and 13, is just a recipe for some really dangerous things that we're seeing right now. Well, and because they were so bad at that 3-13, and 13, and this is some of the arguments that we've had behind the scenes, uh, I, think, I think it caused them to kind of arrogantly cut even that many more of their overpaid middle class. I mean, for sure. When they wait to the last minute, not this season, but last season to get rid of Paul Kruger, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you Paul Kruger is a solution, but that was a solid dude. Um, this was not a team that had Miles Garrett. This was a, a team that had Nate Orchard as a rookie, you know, I mean, so, but they they just they just decided well we're going to save that eight and a half or nine million or whatever it was and then they followed up this off season by by trading Demario Davis and cutting Joe Hayden and I'm not I, again I I think we largely agree on who Joe Hayden is today but mm-hmm. these guys are more than just what they can personally do on the field or how healthy they can stay they are the middle class, even overpaid middle class of an NFL roster that impacts young guys, that influences young guys. And I'm never one of these, I'm never one someone who thinks that you need a mentor in every position group, but the Browns lack 
veteran mentorship across the entire roster. And so they could have used two, three extra marginal guys that would have raised the level um, of of a couple other, uh, maybe, I don't know. It just It just felt like, you know, the margin for error that was so skinny, like you talked about, they made it even skinnier for no reason other than money. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the motivating factor there was because I I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they they thought that they they genuinely thought we can tear this thing down to brass bones and figure it out with the draft and and trying to re-sign different people because like you said if you just cut Paul Kruger or you just cut Joe Hayden is that one cut like cutting James Harrison, you have all of these veterans that can make up for it so it makes a difference so my point is if you add all of those guys up and i've talked about this with numerous people if you add up schwartz and mac and gabriel and and benjamin if you add all and those guys might have left at different points but i'm just talking about adding all of those names up since the the end of the 2015 season to where we are today you run into that you run into we've let go of everybody that has an impact on these young guys and has a level of skill and understanding of how the NFL works that can help us win. So I don't, I don't know where the thought process was if they wanted to make, you know, such drastic cuts so that they could spend big money in free agency. I don't know what it is, but it certainly doesn't do you a favor come free agency. You know, what are those, what, what, what's going to come of it? You know, like our NFL, our other free agents going to look at the Browns and say, man, I really can't wait to go there. Now they, they, they really view the middle class of the NFL to be, an important part of their organization. I, that's the thing that you run into. You, you make your chances so microscopic when you have not one of those cuts, but when you have 10 of them that add up to now, we only have eight guys from, from, from a roster two years before, and we're playing guys that are on average 23 years old. So yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I think we've laid it out pretty fairly. My, my, my biggest gripe is not always going to be the names, the Hughes, the, the Sashis, it is the plan that I think runs into some issues. The plan wasn't – let me take that back. The plan in in theory is good, but the application of the plan is where it got dangerous. Yeah. All right, so what do they, what do, they do next? Uh, I'm, I've, I've convinced myself that they're going to do everything at quarterback. They're going to sign a veteran. They're going to draft somebody number one overall. They're, uh, the only person who's going to be left next year is Deshaun Kaiser, and he's going to probably come out of camp third on the depth yep. chart. Yeah, they have to solve quarterback. That was door point, and that is no secret around the Browns organization and the NFL in general. So, yeah, I think they find a bridge. I think that they will probably try to go after Kirk Cousins with everything they have, and I don't blame them for that. I think Kirk's a really good NFL quarterback who's still only 30, and has proven that he can play at a, at a high level. Does Kirk have interest in Cleveland? Nobody knows. It's higher. It's more chance that he doesn't than he does. But they'll go that route. So if they if they go the Kirk Cousins route, that's the only way I think that they are stopped from from drafting a quarterback first overall. Um, you know, so it it. it it certainly, as Georgia walks in for a touchdown to win it. Um, <laughs> now it certainly is interesting for for them if they if they if they're going to go away from Cousins. It's it's where do they where do they go with a with a veteran? Because not a lot of guys that are going to be veterans are going to enjoy somebody behind them that they know is the first overall pick and is taking my spot. So that cuts your veteran pool in half. I do think they sign one. Um, it might be AJ McCarron. Is he really a veteran? Nobody really knows. But you know, did they sign AJ McCarron? Um, I think a name to keep paying attention to is he's probably cut out of Buffalo. Is Tyrod Taylor if he gets if he gets cut or or trading for Alex Smith? But I'm with you. They will try to bridge it with a veteran, and a first pick is my best guess unless they can sign Kirk. That's how you're probably going to solve this. Deshaun is your third guy. I don't know where Deshaun Kaiser's career goes from here. He is. He is going to be an interesting case study. I think his his maximum level of of uh, of ability in the NFL level is probably going to be a, a, a backup, a Brett Hundley type who can come in and hold the fort down for a starter. He just isn't consistent enough, and nor has he shown the ability to be consistent at any level of play. So, um, yeah, I think I think that's what they have to do. They're going to spend some draft or sorry, some free agency money. They're going to have to overpay some people. Probably going to try to get a corner or or a low Marcus Joyner safety type, um, if they can try to get a wide receiver. Paul Richardson's a name to keep an eye on, a good slot guy with veteran presence. And then they're just going to draft. They can draft 13 guys. That's a lot of guys that you can you can put on your team. It's a pretty deep draft. 
Um, it's, they it's might too use, many. They need to consolidate yeah, picks, man. They they probably will. They might look to jump up with one of those second round picks, jump up into the first round in the late rounds again, or jump up, uh, you know, jump up at the very end of the second round, back into the second round with one of their third rounders. I think they have one third round pick, so they, they're going to move. They probably will, like you said, consolidate. They might use some of those picks to go get an Alex Smith. Um, but yeah, they have a chance, Craig. They have a genuine chance to 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 build a roster with some guys. Now they have some guys that we think are pretty talented. They can build around those guys, and they can try to get the quarterback position right. And in the NFL, if you get the quarterback position right, you can you can win games. So the future isn't bleak. The, the, even though Hugh Jackson's here, and a lot of people might not like him, me included. There's a chance that I think if you can 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 and understand where he's gone wrong in his two years, identify an offensive coordinator, try to take his pressure off of controlling one side of the football, have a say on defense, surround himself with people that he doesn't feel like he has to micromanage. It can work. It can work. It's just they have to they have to they need to take a step back, analyze it what has gone wrong in the coaching department and try to fix it from there. And then on top of that, you get a lot of draft capital to invest in and you get a lot of free agency dollars to spend to improve a roster. It will look vastly different than what it looks like right now come week one next year. Well, and the, the Browns could have won five or six games this year with the 16th or 17th best quarterback in the NFL. If they, if they just don't turn over the ball in the red zone as many did – did he get to 10 uh, red zone turnovers by the end of the year? I, I stopped counting at like eight. Did he have one? Yeah, I think he did get to ten, if not ten, nine, um, which is which is so alarming. <laughs> is so alarming. It's yeah, I think uh, it's it's record breaking. Like zero and sixteen is record breaking. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. And there's there's a balance there. I mean, to quarterback development and putting a lot on their plate. There's there's a failure at that position altogether. But you're right. There's five or six games those guys could have won. Um, I've argued that they could have won those games, so Especially they're not the getting blown game. out. Oh, of course. In the Jets game, they were right there in this most recent one. Pittsburgh, yeah, they sat their three big dogs, but they played a lot of their starters off on defense. So, I mean, it, it's it's not that far away. I truly don't think they're that far away, but they have to – they have to get a lot of the uh, the outside factors to work in their favor instead of against them. So hopefully that's what we find this offseason is the alignment between the power structure of Hugh and, and John Dorsey working with, with Haslam to, to figure out, and Andrew Barry to figure out where the talent is, how they get it, and how it fits into what they want to do. And regardless of whose fault it was, that w- that w- we know for a fact that Sashi Brown and Hugh Jackson did not work together. And that's going to be that's going to be the key, no matter what goes on. And that's what I think you you talked about it earlier. That's what gives me the biggest pause on this whole thing is that we're still sitting with the same structure as what they had before. They've still got Jimmy Haslam sitting atop the whole thing. Um, it, if that doesn't alarm you, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what to tell you at this point. <laughs> There, yeah. At least, at least we have that going for us. Do you know anybody who's a Jimmy Haslam apologist anymore? No, we can. Yeah, like like you made the point there. We can find people that that'll fight for Hugh. Or we can find people that fight for Sashi. But you can't defend the ineptitude that is Jimmy Haslam. There's there's not quite a a strong enough word or sentence you can put together for just how bad he seems to be at an NFL uh, being an NFL owner. So it's really hard. And I think I tweeted this out yesterday. We have a lot of draft capital. You can see a chance for Hugh Jackson to turn it around, but it's really hard to keep your eye at the end of the tunnel and say, you know, I have faith that this is going to turn around because Jimmy Haslam's on top of this whole thing. So the best answer is that hopefully one day, you know, the Browns either defy the odds or he sells the team. That's, that's the only, that's the only answer. So if you look at, if you look at everything now that we've got, as we continue to get more and more distance from this season, we look at everything that happened and the, the changes that the Browns have made uh, as of one one eighteen when we're recording this. It's mm-hmm. kind of uh, Jimmy Haslam's take on continuity, is it not? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, he replaced it's, one it's guy, certainly... and apparently Deep Podesta is even going to stay. Yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he takes this. He takes the top guy out, but he keeps all of those who are in line with the plan to to stay with him. I don't, 
I don't know. I it's it's weird. The, the, it's weird. I don't. I wish I had better words for it, but I don't understand his grand plan. And if you put Jimmy in front of a microphone like he did introdu- introducing John Dorsey, we can't even get to understanding his grand plan because all of the questions go towards pilot or or all over the place with things that he he should be answering on his own time, not people caring about the Browns. So it's like. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what his vision is. Is the idea, hey, we'll, we'll try to balance this out with, with or with with the idea of analytical approach. Are we going to balance this out with a football guy? That that makes sense to an extent, but we need to hear that. That's the plan. Like, hey, we we thought the top of our, you know, we thought our, you know, VP of football operations was, was not, conforming to the plan we wanted here. And we think a football guy who can evaluate and have final say over roster decisions is the way to go. So we didn't get that. We just got Sashi's fired, and here's here's our next guy. So I I, I wish I had a, a, clear, a clear answer on that. I don't. I don't. It's, it's strange, but they even the guy they fire, they fire Sashi Brown, and they won't. I I understand trying to be classy and not throwing a guy under the bus, but at the same time, we we sit here and we look at this guy, and he was supposed to be the chief tiebreaker. He was supposed to be the one talking to Andrew Barry and talking to Hugh Jackson and figuring out what those guys think a great NFL roster looks like and filling, filling out the card. Um, and then somewhere along the line, he thought, he thought he knew what all the answers were, it seems. And he was going to have his voice be the only one that mattered. And he was going to stop listening to Hugh Jackson. And he was, gonna, you know, I, I, who knows about Andrew Barry? We never get to talk to him. Um, yeah, he's but, a ghost for all I know. <laughs> and so I just, uh, yeah, you're right. We have no idea. We have no idea. And that's, that's the most important thing I've learned you know, writing it, waiting for next year for the better part of 10 years and, and really paying attention to the Browns for longer than, you know, I, I obviously was a fan for a long time, but I started blogging about them probably 11, 12 years ago. Um, and that's when I really started thinking about them differently. And the, the most important thing that I've learned is just what I don't know. Um, and, and as I've grown as a professional, you know, with some leadership in my own work life, I, I know what I don't know, and it's vast. And so anybody anybody who talks with a little bit too much uh, certainty in the media or in the public, especially on Twitter, I, you know, anybody who says lock it down or something like that, <laughs> you know, yeah, and that, sure. that's, that's, I think that's, um, if there's an editorial voice waiting for next year, I think that's it. None of us uh, will ever proclaim to know everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. It's, there's a lot of things that go on behind closed doors that, that we, we just, we just will never, we will never know. I mean, you, you could have three different people have an opinion on Corey Coleman coming out when they're all in that room. But if, if, if one person's opinion matters more than the other, they take, so does that mean the organization failed enough opinions weren't right? You know what I mean? So it's like, you just, you never know. We have an idea of what we think went on between Sashi and Hugh, but you never, you just never know. So you just sit back and read the tea leaves and hope that they're, that they're making the right decision based on, on, on you know the leadership you have in place. And when you have a leader like Jimmy Haslam, who's just proven over and over again to to not quite grasp what it takes to win at the at the NFL level or even run a competent organization, flying, pilot flying J included, it, it's tough to sit there as a fan and go, I trust this owner as is the is. You know, I keep using the Patriots and the Steelers as you can trust the Roonies or the Crafts because, you know, these guys have just figured it out. We don't we don't have that. So you find yourself in, in wanting to question every single thing because why wouldn't I? What has my leader shown me to believe that he's making the right decision? So and that may tie back to what you're talking about with the people who blindly defend Sashi Brown without recognizing his failures. They they use it as a crutch with with Jimmy. They think that Jimmy made the wrong move, and even though Sashi might have done some things incorrectly, they they just want to defend him because, you know, I I, I I can't quite figure out what's going on here, but I have no one else to 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 hang on to if that makes sense. You know what I mean? I I, I don't have any other route to hold on to here, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna defend this guy and and blame somebody else. So I. It's it's a mess, man. I don't have there is no quick fix to it. The only fix that makes logical sense is 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 Jimmy Haslam selling the football team and we get an owner who puts the right procedures in place and uh we can lean on that crutch. 
So I don't know if it's hit the site yet, but I think there's a post coming discussing first round uh, running backs, and obviously uh, Saquon Saquon Barkley is the I think pretty much the number one um, running back prospect in the draft this year. Where do, where do you come out on that whole thing? Do you just go, hey, no, Trent Richardson, you can't draft him in the first round, <laughs> or does it depend on the prospect? I, I know that I know you don't think that, by the way, but uh, I'm, I'm just kind of setting you up with that one. That's actually one I haven't heard. I, I've actually seen pretty much now my my opinion of the fan base and the thought process of the fan base is limited to our our blog chats and our and our my you know my Twitter interactions. I haven't seen very many people that are anti Saquon Barkley. I think a lot of that is 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 in the hands of what Ezekiel Elliott has been able to do two years ago um, coming into the NFL. But I mean, the, the uh, kid the kid from the Rams. Yeah, yeah, Todd Gurley. Todd absolutely. Gurley. I think I think it's interesting. It's an interesting discussion. I think we went through a period of time in the mid uh, 2000s to about seven years ago where people started to understand the, the the way running backs were being used wasn't beneficial. The NFL game has changed to an extent, so it has changed to mirror a lot of what we see in college. So taking a lot of these college kids who come from the spread, like these two Georgia running backs, for example, or Saquon who comes from a spread system – it is not foreign for them to jump in and have success. So I caught it, caught into an interesting conversation today about that, and it wasn't just with Michael Hattery who wrote the article you're talking about, or um, a couple other people. But it was it was on the idea of trading up late into the first round to get LSU's Darius Geis, who's a really fun prospect, um, probably just a tier behind Saquon. But do you spend first round capital on on a on a running back these days? And I got to thinking. Yeah, I think in the last three or four years, they've proven that they can. Leonard Fournette has, has gone for 1,000 yards and, and nine touchdowns and 300 receiving yards, carrying you know the Jags to the playoffs to an extent with Blake Bortles there, improving his game. Yeah, Christian he, saved, McCaffrey, he saved that team from Bortles. Yeah, absolutely. And he made Bortles' life easier, and there's no doubt about that because Blake's put together a pretty solid season considering. So those two played well. Yeah, Christian McCaffrey, who set an NFL rookie uh, reception record for running backs, who, who's really killed it. And then you have the year before Ezekiel Elliott and the year before Todd Gurley. So those guys are kind of proving the odds that, you know, if the right guy is there, it's it's worth taking. Um, it, it gets it gets very interesting because the guy, you know, the guy had that conversation I was talking about a minute ago. It said, well, you know, look at the running backs in the third round this past year. We went to the Pro Bowl, Alvin Kamara and Kareem Hunt. And while those are great running backs that I'm, I'm you know, I'm sure that the, the Chiefs and the Saints are so happy to have those guys getting them in the third round. What's the success rate of those guys compared in the last three years of third round running backs compared to first round running backs? And the hit rate is 100 percent in the first round. And it's, you know, it's spotty in the third round. So you're taking a little bit of a lottery ticket there. I think if the value is right and you have somebody like to originally answer your original question with with Saquon, there are guys who can do one and the other. And then there are guys who can do both at a pretty sound. And I think that what you see with Barkley, a guy who can catch the football out of the backfield. Um, caught over 600 yards worth of uh, worth of passes this year, and then and then ran for 1,200-ish yards too, and has a, has really good levels of explosiveness, breakaway speed in the open field. You need that they need to be a full package, and that that's certainly what you get with him. I would have no problem having having seen where the offense struggled this year. I would have zero issue with them taking a plethora of guys at the first pick, their quarterback of choice, or Minka Fitzpatrick from Alabama, or Saquon if they if they feel that they want to get that value. I have no I have no problem with it. I just think it, to 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 pin it down to one thing is a must do. That's not necessarily the case. Do they have to get a quarterback in this group outside of signing Kirk? Yeah, I think they do. But getting a quarterback at four and getting a quarterback at one is not entirely different. When I think there are three guys who could be pretty good in this grouping. So I don't know if they go running back at one. It's interesting. I don't know if they do it. I think that there's gonna they're gonna probably consider Bradley Chubb, the DN from NC State. Um, you can never have enough really, really, really good pass rushers because that's a key element of winning football games is having an elite pass rush. Um, or you can't go wrong with Minka. The, the options are endless here. So it, it 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 to answer. I know I'm getting out in left field in the weeds here, but to to take Saquon Barkley at number one overall should have the fan base making zero complaints. Okay. Um, I want to finish with the quarterbacks. First of all, I think that if the Browns do land somebody like Kirk Cousins, they almost can't take a quarterback first overall. So I, I think those are almost mutually exclusive because I don't think Kirk signs with a team that takes somebody behind him. 
you know, he was the guy who was taken behind RG3. Uh, so he knows what that's like from the, the, the standpoint of the guy who came in and won the job eventually. So that's no, first of, first of all, I think it's more likely to be AJ McKinnon. No, I'm not saying this is my idea, uh, my idea of a good plan, but I think it's more like AJ McCarron, but, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see. Um, if you're drafting number one overall and it has to be a quarterback right now, which one are you drafting? Another tough one. He got some good questions. I, I think you got to you got to vet all of them and you got to figure out what guy works for what Hugh and the offensive coordinator you bring in wants to do. Um, I'm going to take the long approach to this. There There's there's two in my mind that are above the others. I think Rosen, um, who, who plays the quarterback and the way you see it in, 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 in quarterback manuals and what a billboard quarterback looks like for just, you know, you get it six, four two two fifteen ish throws a beautiful, beautiful ball the way you want it to be thrown. He's, he's really good. He has been excellent this year. Um, and in his career, um, in the intermediate passing game, 11 to 19 yards, you know, the NFL is built on that passing range for success. He struggles a bit in the deep ball, um, and his numbers reflect that. Uh, but he's under center. He, he He's comfortable with the footwork. He's comfortable with the processes. There's some red flags in terms of concussions and, and head issues and shoulder surgery he had last year that ended his season. There are some red flags um, about him as a person in terms of does he love football. Uh, I think I think Josh loves football, but you know, you're going to vet those things. The same with the other guy I think who is the lead is Baker Mayfield. Baker comes with his share of red flags, the hyper competitiveness. I think he's got a bit of an anger issue. You know, he's a little shorter for the position than what you want, but he's he's been dynamic in his time um, at, at at Oklahoma. He said quarterback efficiency ratings that have been through the roof. He's shown accuracy to every single level of the field. He does progression football really well from one to the other. I think that, and I tweeted this out that it won't be for me. And the other name is Sam Darnold, who I think needs another year of football, but he might come out. The, the, the thing for me is not who they take at one, but it's how they plan to use them. If it's, if it's me and it's Hugh Jackson based on how he uses a quarterback and what he will want to do more than likely, it will be Josh Rosen. That's just the odds on favorite for the guy they take. I think Baker Mayfield is my number one overall quarterback, but you need to have a plan in place and a structure that works for Baker. Um, that, that really, really fits him from a football standpoint. I think he's a fantastic leader that will bring people around him to another level, but he has to fit into a scheme that they don't play. They just don't play it the way I think he would fit into it perfectly, if that makes sense. He wants to, he wants to be under center and run the ball and do some play action things, and that's not necessarily what what Baker has done. That's been more Josh Rosen. Now, now, now the, the Browns have been in the shotgun, 72% of the time this year, that's because they're behind so often and they're forced to throw. So I think I think it's Rosen. Um, so I'm giving you a bit of a twisted answer. I think it's going to be Rosen, um, but I also could think that the best quarterback in this group is Mayfield. So if you're running the Browns, you're in John Dorsey's seat and you have the opportunity, would you trade the Browns first round for Andrew Luck? I, I, yeah, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't even remotely hesitate to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, Andrew Luck is a top three quarterback in the league, and 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 these guys come back from these shoulder injuries more than they ever have before. So you know, I know there's some people I associate with and talk on Twitter about it, and they're going to have concerns about it. No, you just you do it, and I don't think you blink. Um, you know, especially you get, if you, you look at the back. contract you're going to have to give Kirk Cousins. Yeah, absolutely. Comparatively speaking, so you know, do you want to? Then, then you come to the question: Do you want to risk it with the first? Who, who says Josh Rosen is the answer? You know, who says Baker Mayfield is the answer? Sam Darnold's the answer. You're running a risk there, just the same as you're running a risk, you know, taking on Andrew Luck's shoulder. I'd bet more on Andrew Luck's shoulder than I do on a first overall pick making it. So, that's uh, that's that's the long-winded answer. But uh, with with Andrew Luck, if they're if they're even showing a a glimmer of opportunity for someone to take him. I'm, I'm calling him and, and <laughs> where do we meet to sign the paperwork? So when you're talking Browns and they're zero and sixteen, and and you're talking about the draft already, you just you you turn around and you do forty nine minutes without even blinking. 
Can you believe we've been talking for 49 minutes? <laughs> no, man. When you start talking about stuff you love, it feels like five minutes. <laughs> oh, but, it's crazy. No, it's good stuff. I, I enjoy talking talking Browns football with people that can see through different lens than their own lens. So good stuff. Yeah, we'll do it a lot more. We'll do it a lot more, especially as the draft comes up. Uh, it, it's been really awesome to have you on the team. I'm sorry that we haven't had you on the podcast. We didn't get you before Doug LaMarie got the, Doug Marie Scotch on, but uh, we'll 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 make up for it with the number of appearances. No, I'm all about it. Anytime you want me on, I'm there. All right, thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. It's been the WaitingForNextYear.com podcast.